We have another seemingly simple commandment this week. Don't steal, right? Doesn't it sound simple? Don't put on little black masks, break into other people's windows, sneak in and take other people's TVs while they're asleep at two in the morning. That is what we tend to think about when we think of thievery. We think of stealing, right? And yet, I have to confess that when we turn to uh, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus and he admonishes them, those of you who are thieving, uh, you need to stop that. I have to wonder, is that uh, church that's very permissive or what's going on there? Is half the congregation showing up in little black masks over their eyes? Or little stocking caps having been out late that night stealing whatever the first century equivalent of TVs would be and then show up to church the next morning and it's just a very relaxed uh, church? Or is there something broader that Paul is trying to get at? Well, that is actually the case. The guidance of the Old Testament, when it starts to explain more of the meat of what it means when it says, Thou shalt not steal, uh, makes it actually a far broader uh, commandment. If remembering um, that every commandment has the positive and the negative side. It's not only thou shalt not, but thou shalt for on each side of every commandment. It's not just thou shalt not steal, it's also thou shalt protect your other your neighbor's economic uh, endeavors, their economic safety. And so the Old Testament begins to lay this out. It's not just don't steal your neighbor's ox. It's not just if you see your neighbor's ox out of the pasture, go tell them. It's actively go help with the ox, even if you hate your neighbor. It specifically says, even if it's a neighbor you hate, and we do end up with neighbors we don't get along with sometimes, doesn't matter. Don't steal means helping your neighbor with their ox. This guide lays out how Jewish people are to live, not just when it comes to people's ox, when it, but also when it comes to when other people go hungry. If someone goes hungry in your community, they are always able to walk into another person's field and gather enough grain to go home and bake some bread so they, they do not starve that day. Or gather a few grapes so that they might have something for lunch. However, it also says, they shall not take an, a sickle and go out and reap your wheat or bring a basket and start taking in your grapes. And so there's a balance there. If, I, uh, if you are economically endangered such that you are not going to have anything to eat, to let you starve would be theft from you. But you can't show up with a sickle and start taking in my grain because that would be theft from me. Another example uh, that we are far more familiar with is the idea that you shall not uh, charge interest on loans. Jewish practice, do not charge interest on loans. And the context here matters because the, the way that loans would be asked for in that day was um, you'd ask for a loan if you were in economic danger. Something had gone wrong and you just needed money to get through. And so if you come to, a neighbor comes to you and asks for money to get through this economic uh, hard times and you charge interest, what you're doing is kicking a person while they're down. They're already having to ask for money. Why are you trying to get more out of them? Right? And so you don't pile on and charge interest when a person is so down on their luck that uh, they need to ask for a loan. It's stealing food out of the mouth of that family. And it's already not certain that they will have food at all. Now I should note that's a different way of giving loans than we tend to think about today. Uh, if I go to the bank and I'm getting a loan <coughs> to buy a car, that's a different type of transaction. I think it would be far more analogous to uh, if someone knocked on your door and said, my house just burned down, I need uh, clothing to put on my children, and you reach into your wallet and said, well, I'll give you 200 bucks at 5% interest. Y you just don't do that, right? That, that, that's piling on when the person's already down. We see that this way of pr protecting, uh, again, and protecting the economic uh, the livelihood of people, it, it extends throughout the Old Testament, even in the situations where no one smells like roses. We read the story of Jacob and Laban. 
And Jacob and Laban, that entire story in, in Genesis is, is basically one long story of, of who can get who, who can have, who can uh, pull a fast one quicker. And, and near the end of the story, Jacob says, it's a good thing God's looking out for me because Laban kept on changing my wages on me. And so even when Jacob, the thief, the trickster, uh, even him, who isn't exactly an upright stand, stand-up character, God's watching out even for him because he's the one who has the less, lesser power. And, and so that someone will be trying to pull a fast one, Laban, and changing his wages on him, that, that was considered a, a, an attempt of theft. The prophets then take this, this way of living, these individual situations, and the prophets help us see how it can become the way of life of an entire nation and, and can call an entire nation back uh, away from this way of, 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 of making it acceptable in culture for thievery to, to happen. We see this, it's in Amos, uh, thus says the Lord, Amos 2, uh, <clears throat> thus says the Lord, for the transgressions of Israel, I will not revoke the punishment, for they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. You know, if uh, people are selling this themselves into servitude because the economic times are hard, right, the people will then, then have to, it, what's happening is uh, the times are so hard that people in the time of Amos are having to, to take out loans and having to, to, to really take out loans just to be able to make it. And you can ask for surety. You could ask for collateral. You could ask for something to... Um, to guarantee they'll get the loan back, but the Old Testament tells us that you can't ask for the millstone because that's how they feed their family, or you, you can't ask for a person's cloak because that's how they stay warm at night. There are things you cannot ask for, for as collateral. You can't ask for a person's millstone because that's how they feed the family. You can't ask for the cloak. That's how they stay warm. And Amos points out that the bankers, the people offering the loans, they're wrapping themselves up in other people's cloak as they, as they lay down next to their altars because they're good church-going people. They're, they're wrapped up in the clothes that indict them because they are taking collateral that is damaging people. It's, it's theft is what is being compared to. Isaiah 10 uh, further adds, you who make iniquitous decrees, who write oppressive statutes to turn aside the needy from justice and rob the poor of my people of their right. All right it, we're, then now we're getting into the writing of oppressive statutes, the laws, right? If you're writing laws that oppress those who are already in an economic danger, this is theft is what it's being called out as. This is breaking the commandment. It echoes what we read in Proverbs 22, 22. Do not rob the poor because they are poor, or crush the poor in the gate. Now the gate reference, right? Don't pr crush the poor in the gate. The gate is where decisions are made in a community, the economic decisions. It's not in the marketplace because that's where you go to trade. But yet to get your, your goods to market, you have to got, you got to go through the gate. And it's at the gate where any disagreements are uh, figured out. That's where all the disputes are handled. And so to crush the poor in the gate, it's to abuse the poor in the courts. It's to, to set it up so that those who are at court, those who have less, who can't afford the good lawyers, well, they're not, they're not going to have it go their way, regardless of whether they are in the right or not. Now, why does this happen? Why do cultures have to be called out? Why do communities have to be called out by the prophets? Why do people do this? I do not think that there is some grand conspiracy. What I think is happening is far simpler and far more understandable. I think people uh, argue from their point of view. I think people argue from their point of view, and, and those who uh, have the most influence on the legal and the economic systems are those who are the loudest. And so if, if you think of uh, the Koch brothers, right? The Koch brothers, they're, why do we even know who, who they are, that name? It's the name of these folks who are down in Texas and they have a lot of money and they're willing to use that money to support what they believe in politically. They have a lot of money, they have the loudest voice, they have a particular point of view based upon how they see the world and they have a lot of money and so they want the world to work the way that makes sense to them. 
And so economic systems over time, economic and legal systems over time bend as laws continue to be written. They, they bend and they form themselves around those who have the most influence against those who have the least influence. And those who have the least influence in any economic or legal system are those who are too busy just trying to put food on the table to be involved in the political system. Right? And so there are uh, situations where the entire economy, the entire legal system is just bent over time against those who have the least. We have examples of when this is called out in Nehemiah. Nehemiah calls out the city of Jerusalem because people are having to sell their children into servitude. They have to pick which child they'll sell into servitude to feed the rest. We'll sell Timmy so that the other five children can eat. And so Nehemiah calls the city out for this and says that those, you, 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 those of you who are giving loans, those of you who are in positions of authority, you must stop. You must repent. And, and you must stop charging interest on on these folks who are already down and out. And the city does let the people go and the city adjusts its ways. And so there are times when a prophet is needed to stand up and to speak truth so that a city can recognize its way and turn away from that. Right? To not steal, the first step towards not stealing and to obeying this commandment is to be able to name that there is a common good, that we are in this together as a state, as a nation, as a community, and to know that there is this common good to be able to start to describe it. It's, it's, we start to see it like in places like Acts 2 where it talks about how people would sell what they had for the good of others because there was a common good. We look at what Jesus proclaims in the kingdom of God, and we say that's where we're heading. That's a common good. That's how we are meant to live together. And then we can start to name anything that breaks that common good is theft. Right? We continue to struggle with this in our culture and our communities as well, for so much of it is just sort of baked into the systems in which we live. And, and I want to show you an example of this, and it's a seemingly small example, but it matters in, in our lives together. It's the court fee system. All right? If you go to court, you have to pay a fee. How does that work? All right, let, let's imagine a situation. Imagine that you are living uh, paycheck to paycheck. 70% of people within five miles of where I stand are living paycheck to paycheck. And I know that because 70% of people within five miles where I stand don't have a bank account. All right, so people are living paycheck to paycheck. Imagine you're living paycheck to paycheck and you get a speeding ticket. Or you end up in a dispute with your landlord. Or something happens and you end up in court. And you show up to court and you say, Judge, I have no money. I need a public defender. I need a lawyer. And so you get given a public defender. And you know what the first thing that lawyer does? The lawyer you're given because you don't have the money to pay a lawyer, that lawyer charges you. In Missouri, as well as 42 other states, you are charged for the lawyer that you get because you cannot afford a lawyer. Right? And then in certain states, you actually get to charge for having, a, you get charged per day for having a jury as well. $250 a day in the state of Washington. And so let's say you win. You're free, right? You have, you have figured out how to pay for the lawyer that you have to pay and that you get because you can't pay a lawyer. And, and you go to court and you win. You're innocent. You still have court fees. You are in court. You have to pay the fees. And you know what happens if you can't pay the fees? You go to jail. There are certain counties in this country where a quarter of the people in jail, Benton County, Washington is one of them, where a quarter of the people in jail are not in prison because they did a crime, they're in prison because of the fees that were associated with being in the court system, which accrue at 12% interest if you don't pay them and have late fees. It sounds like a bad credit card. And, uh, you know, and you go to jail to wipe out the fees, right? You go to jail and you can wipe out the fees. That, that's great. You'll go to jail, you'll wipe out the fees, except if you go to jail to wipe out the fees that you can't pay otherwise, who's going to hold your job? If you call up to the PSF up to farmland and say, you know what, i got to go to jail for a week, can I have a week off? Are they going to give you a week off on short notice? Right? That's not going to happen. And then 41 states will charge you the room and board for being in jail to pay off the fees that you couldn't afford to pay. And so you come out of jail and you have to pay fees for being in jail to pay off fees. Now, and let's say 
that you can't pay the fees and, and you, they're a warrant for your arrest and they come and pick you up the shortest amount of time that it will take for you to get in front of a judge to be able to say, judge, I can't pay it. Well, we have four court days a month in Sullivan County, two Mondays and two Thursdays. And so if you end up in jail, the shortest amount of time you're going to be in jail is a week before you show up to the judge and say, I can't pay the fees, uh, even though I was declared innocent and I had to pay for the lawyer I had because I couldn't pay for a lawyer. Um, it's a week. And who, who gives someone a week off with absolutely no notice? Right? <clears throat> so you get, let, and let's say you lost in court. God help you, you lost in court. In addition to paying a fee and going to jail and paying to be in jail, you will now pay to be on probation. 44 states charged for being on probation or parole. And you get out. <clears throat> And now you have lost the ability to have food stamps or TANF and housing because you know once you've been in jail, you never are hungry again or you never need help again or never need housing again, right? Now, why do we do this? We are set up this way because we need to pay for our courthouses. And it is fair that those who use it should pay for it. Well, you know, isn't that fair, right? It might be fair, but let me just tell you what happens, right? I, I was going to pick up my mom in La Plata. I found a speed trap. I should have pay, been, pay, been paying more attention. That's life. I got a ticket. You know what I did? I went down to La Plata. It's like two years ago. Y'all don't even know this happened. I went down to La Plata. I paid my $200 for the ticket. I paid $150 in court fees. I wrote a check. I went home. I lost a day and 350 bucks. It was annoying. That's life. It's fair, right? I paid for the court that I had to go to. But I was not economically endangered by that event. And those who cannot get a day off, can't come up with 350 bucks, they are economically endangered by how this is set up. It may be fair that everyone who is uh, using the court system has to pay for the court system, but it's not just. And when we're economically, excuse me, economically endangering, endangering our neighbor like this, I think we call it something. I, I think we call it theft. I think we call it theft. It endangers the economic future of those charged because no one goes to court by choice but your life can be destroyed because you had to. You know, I look at all of this and I think of what is Deuteronomy 24 7 we heard before. You cannot take a person's millstone no matter what because that's how they th feed their family. I think of Proverbs 22 about not crushing the poor in court. And I think that's what we're seeing today in America. Now, I do need to say that uh, here in Sullivan County, it's not that bad. Our local uh, judge, Tracy Mason White, does a great job of working with folks. Uh, she will ask them, you know, what can you pay? Ten bucks a month? Then that's what she'll take. And so she does a great job. She runs the system as gracefully as the system can be run. But it sure would be a lot better if we just got rid of the fees, or at least made it so that if you made under a certain amount of money, you just weren't charged the fees. It might mean that those of us who can pay might have to pay a few more dollars, but that would be the cost for not economically endangering our neighbors. There are other aspects of our culture, other systems of theft we could look at. The move from 401ks, or the move to 401ks away from defined benefit pension programs. That this is a long-term robbery, because it used to be you retired in your 60s and you were okay. For the rest of your life, you would have some money to live on. With 401ks, you know, it's, that's not a given. The average amount of money people are hitting retirement in, in 401ks is 120000 which does not go very far when you're 65, right? That doesn't go very far at all. That's a long-term endangerment of our neighbors by a decision about how pensions are run, right? We can look at that. We can look at the stagnating wage of those who work for hourly wages. We could look at the, the growing gap between the richest and the poorest. We could look at things like Enron or the 2008 uh, banking uh, debacle. You know, you look at that and how many people's retirements were just decimated by the idiocy of banks that were greedy. And that might be one of the largest acts of thievery that have happened, that has happened in a century. <clears throat> 
And, and let me just say, before we uh, go into what individually, how we respond to this, um, this economic endangerment of neighbor, if you can buy a pair of tires tomorrow without flinching, without it endangering whether you'll eat dinner, you're probably not in economic danger or at any risk of being so, right? When Paul uh, cautioned those in the church of Ephesus not to steal, this is the warning for those who... Uh, who are acting in ways we've described, who are getting the advantage of these systems, and, and where those who, who, for who, against those for whom if they lost a pair of tires on their car, that would endanger whether they could feed their children. All right, so that, that's not, uh, let's be clear about who this addresses. And second, you know, we're gonna talk about um, how we individually respond. Uh, there are a lot of ways to respond to this problem of thievery, of systemic theft in our culture, and we respond in different ways. A Republican response is different than a Democratic response, is different than a liberal response, is different than a socialist or a Marxist or a, I mean, pick what, Occupy, uh, uh, ta uh, Tea Party, you pick your political affiliation. I'm not saying any one of them is right or wrong. What I'm saying is that what we argue about is the thievery. What is essential that we focus on as Christians is breaking this commandment. And we argue about how we're going to respond to it from different points of view, but this is the problem to look at. Right? And so what do we do with this? First, we've got to be able to name that it's a problem. We have to tell the truth and be bold enough to say there are patterns of thievery built into our culture. Right? Nothing is going to change while we ignore the way that our neighbor's economic future is being endangered, whether it be from court, free, court fees, the decaying value of Social Security, or the inability to find a good job. These are endangerments of our neighbors neighbors. Second, we proclaim that there has to be a better way. There is a better way. We follow Jesus. He got over being dead. There is a better way. There is no problem too big that cannot be solved, cannot be approached, cannot be grappled with. We can look at Acts. We can look at the kingdom of God. We can look at Jesus and say there are ways we can get to be more like that. And then as individuals, we can make very sure that no one ever walks away from a Christian and think they've been had. No one ever walks away from a Christian and thinks that they were on the, the wrong end of a deal. So no one ever thinks, no one ever believes that their family has been mistreated economically because of something that we have done. And if that means that we, have, we make a deal and then later we've got to go back and say, I, we need to renegotiate, I got too, too good of a deal off you, then that's what we may need to do. All right. We stand up and we are square in our dealings, and we also stand up for justice ourselves. We proclaim, we speak the truth that there is a justice, that, that there needs to be an approach of justice. And we acknowledge that that's complex. Start talking about justice, and there are three different ideas around justice that we have to find a balance between. There's the idea that justice is those who work more should get more. That's justice. You work more, you should get more. There's the idea that justice, everyone is equal, so everyone deserves the same. And then there's justice where those who need more should get more. And finding a dynamic balance between those three, you work harder, you get more, everyone is equal, those who need more get more, that's what we, we are called to do. I mean, we've got to find that balance between those three. That's actually what justice is. And if you want to see how that really works out, go to a school board meeting where they're trying to figure out how to split the funding between the advanced placement, the gen ed, and the special ed. Right? That, that's what work harder, get more, gen, spe, uh, advanced placement, gen ed, everyone's equal, special ed, those who need more should get more. Which of those three gets the most attention from Jesus? Which one is most important? It's the last one. Those who need more should get more. That's what Jesus focuses on. Good news to the poor. Good, though, good news to those who need more. And so as Christians, when it comes to discussions of justice, we lean towards that third one. Right? Finally, we become very aware that everything we have is a gift. Everything we have is a gift. It has been passed down to us from those who came before. And, you know, and, and we can work hard our entire lives, but what we work hard with 
is the giftedness that we have been given. I work hard with the education I've been given. I work hard to be a father, having been shown how to be a father by my own. We work hard to do what we do, but we work on the roads that were paid for by the, in the 1950s from the generation before us. We, we work hard. But everything we have, we work hard with the gifts that we have been given. Everything we have is a gift. And the best practice we have as followers of Jesus to remind us that everything we have is a gift is tithing. Tithing is this practice where weekly or, or monthly, it, we take the very first, the first fruits, the first 10%, and we give it to God and we say thank you. Thank you for the other 90. Here's the first 10. All right? And once we have we practice letting go, having an open hand, it's a lot easier once we have given to God to hold the rest of it far more lightly so that when we see our neighbor in distress, we can let go of maybe a bit more to help our neighbor. Don't steal. It is a bit more complicated than I thought it would be, and I'm sure it's a bit more complicated than you thought it would be, but it becomes the way we talk about something essential to our life together. Watch out for your neighbor's ox. Make sure everyone gets justice in court. Construct a way of life together so that no one needs worry about being hungry. Wouldn't that be good, nice? To be building a community where no one needs to worry about being hungry. Where you never hear about justice being perverted, about someone getting a rough run just because they can't afford a lawyer. Right? There are embedded ways in our culture, ways of thievery that we are called to name and to grapple with. To take these matters into our hands and to live such that indeed we are watching out for our neighbors. Amen.